whatever's on their mind. So, I guess, Barry, you want to do the first question? Yes, we could. Mr. President, um, if we could start out with a non-summit related question having to do with the topic of the moment, which seems to be drugs. In your announcement yesterday of the formation of this bipartisan uh, executive legislative task force for drugs, you said, uh, quote, nothing should be overlooked or ruled out uh, in the purview of this, of this group. Uh, yet you went on to say several things that strongly implied that uh, you were quite prepared to rule out one thing, and that is the complete legalization of drugs as a means of drying out the market. Could you uh, tell us why you are against that, if indeed you are? Oh, yes, I am definitely against it. I think it is silly to think that that could uh, do away with the drug problem. We're talking about something that destroys people's lives, either takes their lives or uh, destroys them to the point that they're no longer uh, normal human beings. And uh, so I don't think that's for consideration at all. What I wanted from the commission also was not a report on what the situation is. We were well aware of that. What I want is specific things that can be of, of help. And a couple of them I mentioned in my remarks yesterday, such as uh, their recommendation on the death penalty for uh, drug-related deaths caused uh, by the drug merchants, the killers of cops and so forth, uh, things of that kind. We know this is the frustrating thing in this. Uh, when I hear these people that uh, with some critical sound in their voice say, well, we're losing the battle, or we've lost it as if somehow we've let down and are not doing all we can do. We are intercepting more drugs than we've ever intercepted before. We are, the money that has been seized, the vehicles, the airplanes, the uh, boats, and so forth, have broken all records. But the drugs are still coming in because our boundaries are the same as they are, and it's it's a thing that can be grown someplace in the world, the source of this. And uh, so what we have come to realize is that the, the only real way, you don't let up on the other. You make it difficult for them to get that in. But then you've got to take the customer away from the drug instead of the other way around. And that's why we've got to find out, are there things we're not doing? Are there things we're doing but could do, be do, done better or more of? To, um, to head off and make the people turn against it. And I would like their recommendations on that. But I'm sure you're familiar, sir, with the argument <coughs> for legalization, which is that if there were no risk involved, you would dry up profits of these drug uh, traffickers, and therefore that market that, that comes out of Colombia and other places in the world would dry up and uh, have a severe impact on the uh, availability of the drugs and allowing the government to concentrate, concentrate its efforts on the demand side. On the other hand, though, what you're talking about is, first of all, uh, there'd be an industry there, whether it'd be the same people, whether the proceeds would be as lavish as they are now, price-wise and so forth, on this. But you're talking about the idea of something that destroys human beings, and by legalizing it, then you drive down the highway and you look up and there's a billboard and it doesn't say, uh, uh, eat jello, it... Uh, <laughs> says try cocaine and uh, your papers and your magazines full of attractive ads saying oh have a ball get stoned on cocaine you'll never try anything else and uh, it's ridiculous to say that you take something that is as destructive to human beings as this and uh, then turn it out to where the merchandising of it to, to increase profits will be a constant effort to increase the demand Mr. President, yesterday <clears throat> the Vice President said some things about uh, dealing with drug traffickers that differ from the policies that uh, have been coming out of your administration as far as Mr. Noriega is concerned uh, in the last few weeks. Does he have your blessing to separate himself now politically from you and his campaign? He's got to do what he feels is, is right for him and his campaign, and I'm going to help him all I can because uh, I think he is the candidate on the on the horizon that uh, is best suited and qualified for this job. I think what he said largely, I could say uh, in, in generalizing, without picking out an individual, and that is, uh, no, I don't want to do business with drug dealers. And uh, that was in, fa in effect what he was saying. 
And I know he was referring to a specific case, probably, that is very much uh, open to the people. But uh, here again, uh, the people have not heard the true situation or all the facts uh, surrounding this particular thing. And I can't answer your questions on that now because it's in a very uh, delicate stage of the negotiations. And it's only if and when that I will be able to then say and tell, and I will tell exactly what, what is going, going on and what we're trying to achieve. Basically, what we're trying to achieve is the restoration of democracy to the state, to the country of Panama. If I, I may return to the political question, Mr. President, have you and the Vice President discussed the idea of him going off on his own and stating policies that may differ from yours? Has, has yes, he brought sir. it to you directly? And I have made it plain to him that I know that he's going to have to do what he feels is right to, for his campaign. Do you have any timetable for getting Noriega out of there? They, I gather uh, they came pretty close. You've come pretty close this week. Uh, well, I wish it were like last month. <laughs> but uh, uh, no, I, I don't know what the, the uh, time situation can be. And again, as I say, negotiations at a stage that I, I can't comment. Uh, let me uh, turn to, to the summit for a second. Uh, do you expect to make enough progress in Moscow to have yet another summit before you leave office? I don't know. I think there's a possibility of that. Uh, that would depend mainly and probably on uh, the START Treaty, because it uh, seems very doubtful. That's a very complex treaty, much more so than INF, and I, I think that, uh, uh, that, that it's very doubtful that that could be ready for a signature uh, on uh, uh, this coming summit. I just don't think it's possible. But if we're going to continue working as hard and as fast as we can as we have been in the last several months, and uh, I would like to think, uh, not just to catch it on my watch that uh, we get to sign this, but I would like to think that uh, we could get an agreement, and the earlier the better, because that would start the reduction of the number of, of intercontinental ballistic missiles that are aimed at each other. Sir, what is the likelihood of your signing something in the Moscow summit, uh, a status report, for example, on where, where the United States and the Soviet Union stand on arms control has been mentioned as a possibility. Uh, do you foresee that sort of thing? Well, I don't know about that particular thing, but I know there are a number of bilateral issues that we'll be discussing also, things that uh, we're coming to agreement on, having to do with things like fisheries and things of that kind. So there will be, there will be some things accomplished and tied up while we're there. But could you weigh uh, the likelihood of those being signed, uh, either bilateral issues versus some sort of arms control agreement? And by, excuse me, let me remove the word agreement, but simply status report, as I said before. Well, I think we'll, yes, we'll be discussing. If it is not, as I say, it's not very likely that it will not have been agreed to in the start agreement. But he and I, am sure, will carry on then with where are the areas in which we are together and where are the things that are still left undecided. And uh, we'll try to see if we can't come up with some help for the people that have been handling the details of this. On, uh, finish, Barry. Yes. On the details, Mr. President, what would, would you be prepared to enter into an agreement in which the sea launch cruise missile issue is not settled, or at least uh, certain limits are accepted without verification, if we could get the agreement in your term? Oh, I don't want to ever sign any, anything without verification. That, I think, is, is vital. And even though he's getting very tired of hearing me recite my Russian proverb, dovayai no provayai, trust but verify. Let me uh, ask you for a second about your broader attitudes towards the uh, Soviet Union and how they've evolved. Uh, do you still think the Soviets are out to rule the world? I think in the same sense that we say that we think that all men should be free and uh, have the ability to determine their own governments and so forth, I'm sure that, uh, that he believes in the system in which he's been raised. Uh, he's young enough that he's spent his entire life in that system. 
I think that also one of our problems is that he's inclined to believe uh, the propaganda that he's heard all his life about us. But at the same time, we have managed to make a great deal of progress, as is evident in things like INF. And uh, now I have to come back to what <laughs> your original question was here. I got sidetracked on what you were specifically. Well, just, uh, do, do you think, I'm interested in how your own views have evolved towards the Soviet Union, whether, uh, let me re rephrase it, do you, do you still think the Soviet Union is an evil empire? Well, let me put it this way. I think under this leader, more progress has been made toward the things that we ourselves believe in. His glasnost, his perestroika, I read it cover to cover. And uh, I think this indicates that uh, there are changes that he is advocating. As a matter of fact, I'm, we're quite well aware that he's meeting with quite some opposition among uh, the bureaucracy, the nomenclatura, as it's called there, uh, in the Soviet Union. But so, these are things that uh, bring him somewhat closer uh, to our views. For example, recently it was revealed that he has told the uh, Orthodox Church there that some restrictions uh, that have been imposed upon them are, are lifted, going to be lifted, and uh, they're going to be freed somewhat. We have four main areas that we're going to discuss, and one of them will be human rights. And there is some progress now being made uh, in that area. Uh, the arms agreements and the attempt to, to reduce uh, armaments, and there again, he has showed a willingness. In INF, that treaty, this, I think I can say without uh, any argument, this is the first time <coughs> that any Soviet leader has ever agreed to destroy weapons they already have. And then there are the bilateral agreements, the things that I mentioned uh, earlier here and that we'll be taking up when we get there. That's three of them, arms control and the, the human rights and uh, the bilateral agreements. Uh, the fourth one. Regional. Regional, yes. Regional, I should forget that when they're already marching their troops out of Afghanistan. That's silly of me. But there are other areas there, Angola, Nicaragua, other spots of that kind. And, and, uh, but the very fact of the leaving of, of Afghanistan after nine years uh, shows that uh, this man is approaching things in a different way. Have you managed to close the distance between the, the two of you on the subject of strategic defense at all? On strategic defense? Yeah. Well, when you stop to think that uh, that ended the summit meeting in Reykjavik because of their demand, just cold demand, the elimination of it. And since then, they have come back, and that has not been a factor in the things we're dealing in. Uh, so I think that, uh, I don't think that that's going to be an issue in the, in the arms race. Mr. President, there has been some speculation that uh, Mr. Gorbachev may, either just before your summit meeting or uh, at the very beginning of it, announce a major troop withdrawal from uh, Eastern Europe, say 100, 200,000 troops. Uh, this would be, by most accounts, a fairly major public relations move on his part. Uh, but I'm wondering how you would react to that. Well, again, I think it's a part and parcel of the difference between him and the previous leaders we've dealt with. Because when you talk about NATO versus the Soviet Union, you can't ignore the fact that if there ever were, or ever was a conflict uh, between the two, the Eastern Europe uh, would be a part of the military force of the Soviet Union. That is in the very manner in which it is established there, that the Soviets could give the orders. So this withdrawing of troops and so forth, I think, is, is another indication of a change of attitude. But I think it's also motivated by the economic problem that he has. There's no question but the armaments and the military have been one of the principal factors in uh, their economic uh, disarray. Can I come back to SDI just for a second? You, you, you said that it, uh, since then they've come back uh, you said it's not a factor. You don't think it's going to be an issue in the arms race. That's a pretty strong statement. 
You don't think it's going to be a, that SDI is not a factor anymore in your? I doubt that. Uh, uh, I doubt that there would be some time where, like coming down to the ability to sign to agree on reductions of arms, and then make that as a price. I don't think that would happen. And if it did, I'd do the same thing I did in Reykjavik. I go home. Because uh, this, I think that this is it could be one of the biggest potentials for making nuclear weapons obsolete. If a defense could be perfected in which each country knew that the chance of getting uh, a number of, of nuclear missiles through the defense was so limited in those numbers, then I don't think you'd see anyone daring a first strike knowing that the other fellow could shoot back. And I have said repeatedly that I am willing, once we've established that we have this and it, that it is that kind of a, almost a, a well, a, a defense that is almost impenetrable, uh, I would be, I'd be pleased uh, to see the world, to, to provide this uh, information to the world, uh, with the price being the elimination of nuclear weapons. And then, as I just told someone earlier today, you, uh, you'd say, well, what do you need if, if you've done away with nuclear weapons? Why do you need this? Why do we need gas masks? Now, we were supposed to have done away with gas. Uh, as long as the world knows how to make a nuclear missile, you have to be prepared that someday, even if the rest of us have done away with them, someday there can come along another madman and who could decide secretly to arm himself with those. So it would be awfully nice to do what we did in uh, Geneva after World War I when we all agreed to rule out gas, poison gas, but everybody kept their gas masks. Mr. President, I'd like to come back to Mr. Gorbachev. You've mentioned him as being a different Soviet leader. You also talked about new religious freedoms that may be coming in the Soviet Union. Two parts. Do you think he is perhaps deep down a religious man? I would have no way to judge that. I thought I did once. Because, in fact, I mentioned once that twice in a conversation he had invoked the name of God. Mm -hmm. And this happened more in the several times during the uh, summit here. And I was really thought I was in the track of something. And was, as you say, I wanted to see if I could find out. But then a very knowledgeable Russian expert told me that, no, they all do it. But it's God with a small g. It is just a, an expression, a manner of speech. Was that Mrs. Massey by any chance who uh, pointed no, that No, no, uh-uh. And uh, said that this was just a, it was an expression. It was just in their, their vocabulary and dialogue. How would you characterize your relationship with him? And how do you think that relationship can be used to solve international problems between the US and the Soviet Union? Well, he's, he's different in my view, than any Russian leader that I've met and dealt with before, in that he somehow can keep, oh, we argue. And there's no question, as I say, he believes the, the propaganda that he's grown up with about us. But uh, at the same time, and I don't think that it is, uh, uh, that it is just a, a playing a part on, uh, by him, <coughs> that um, when the battles and the arguments are over, uh, there is a personal relationship there that uh, I've never felt with any of the others. And, uh, what is it? What is that feeling? Well, I, I think that he can do this, and it's, a, it's an argument over uh, these facts and so forth. It does not become a personal distaste for the other individual in the argument. And, and how important is that to U.S.-Soviet relations? Oh, I think, that it's, I think that it's been a great help. I think we've, well, we have gone as I say, so much farther than has ever been done before. And I, and I think that uh, that's, that's a good part of it. We're going to have to take the final question or two. I've got one, if I can sneak in another non-summit question having to do with the trade bill. Why are you waiting to veto this bill? The trade numbers came out the other day, it seemed to be to me a, a, just the ideal time to come in with a veto that you've been more or less promising for weeks now, and yet uh, you don't seem to be taking the, that moment. Why not? Well, we'll be coming to that because <laughs> our plate has been so full, and uh, we did have some leeway there some time, and uh, 
it's a pretty complicated thing itself uh, to look at. And uh, I just uh, haven't felt that uh, we've had enough time to sit down with that on the table before us, as we have with some other things that are going on, including the Panama situation and all. And but you, you've known for some time and have said publicly many times over the past month that you would veto that bill, particularly because of the inclusion of the plant closing yes. uh, provisions. Um, what's to learn more about it? <laughs> <laughs> well, there are a lot of things in there, in the, in the bill also. They, they kind of acted with that like they do with the budget, where they throw in the kitchen sink and the... <laughs> Uh, like the continuing yeah. resolution at the end of the year, you mean? Yes. Uh, so I want to look at it because out of it not only comes whether you're going to veto it or not, but um, what you're going to say about it, the things that you're going to agree with and wish that they would send back uh, without the excess baggage. Thank you, Mr. Thank President. You. That's it. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. All right. Wasn't that much more fun than going out in the briefing room? <laughs> <laughs> Don't forget your uh, tips before you oh. walk away. Here. Oh, yeah. yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, Thank you, sir. Good yeah. to see you again. Well, good to see you. Thanks very much. Right. Thank, Thank you. you. Oops. Yep.